Bismillah rahman rahim Allah. Um, just put a lot of barakah in today's conversation. May it be beneficial to every single person who tunes into this episode and put barakah in our time and Ines and the team at she, um, tea with she and, and the whole organization. Um, and just, yeah, bless this call and just, um, yeah, allow us the confidence and the, yeah, courage to really go where we need to in this conversation. I mean, that was beautiful. Mm-hmm. So, alaikum to everyone who's listening. My name is Ines and I'm part of the um, She Campaign team. Um, today I'm with Nazira. Um, so, she is a life and career coach for women. Her clients usually can't come to her when they're feeling a bit stuck and need help figuring out direction within their own lives. Um, Her signature program, Prioritize to Pivot, allows women to carve out intentional time and space so that they can say no to things that can take them off course and be a full yes to the vision that their souls has in mind for them. Nazira believes in following that still quiet voice that is always available to you when you tune into it. Uh, you can stay connected with her at preparefortheour.com where she, where she is building a community of women who want to learn how to tune into their soul's guidance so that they can put sustained effort into building their visions and staying their course in a world that is full of shiny objects and alluring distractions. Uh, so I call Nazira and welcome. Thank you so much for um, coming into our podcast today. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me, Ines, and the team. Yes. Um, so I remember we called yesterday. We had a very brief conversation. Um, and from our conversation, when we're going back and forth with some of our discussion points, I kind of got the sense um, that we both wanted to explore the concept of listening to our inner intuitions and inner voice that um, so often um kind of get squished by all of those outside um, voices and distractions Um, and also using that to kind of guide um, ourselves throughout our lives and um, especially when we're met or faced with those uh, periods of transition um, within our lives Um, and I think this is a very um, timely topic Um, and we did touch upon this yesterday especially with everything that's going on with COVID, a lot of us have been forced to kind of reflect in our own lives and to kind of seek out what really is important um, within our own lives. And I think this really ties in very nicely with um, how you found yourself doing what you do now, which is a life coach. Yes. So I originally, it was really funny because when I did my Bachelor of Commerce at uni, Um, I fell into life coaching very young at like 22. (laughs) I was back in Melbourne uni. I remember back in a lecture theater that I knew and loved. It was, you know, where we had our economics lectures and um, I was finding myself at, um, at an event that went on for two and a half days. I was there pretty much right after my parents had divorced um, when I was 16. And so it was fresh with all these, you know, emotions that I hadn't quite processed. And at the end of this two and a half days, they, literally just you know made an invitation to if you wanted to train um like the guy in the front of the room was helping people in the whole you know lecture theater you could come to sydney and you know actually train to become a life coach now this was way back when life coaching wasn't a thing nobody knew what it was yeah but back then like i just had this real visceral like gut feeling that i didn't know what it was like i I had an experience of it but i didn't have to know the logic behind oh what was going to happen after the training i just knew that i had to do the training and so I was um saving up money for my first car uh, back then and I said yes you know to the training and so that's kind of when this sort of passion developed so that was like 12 years ago um but then you know so that was like my first instance of like really having a high stakes decision to make but tuning into my own gut and my intuition that still small voice that kind of talks to you quite quietly. It doesn't really shout (laughs) unless, you know, it really needs to get your attention if you haven't been listening. But that was my sort of first taste of actually, you know what, this is a direction that I need to go in. And I was very clear, like I had a full body kind of response to that. And then um, I had a transition away from life coaching and actually helped other coaches and healers um, help 
I helped them with sales because my mentor actually said, you know, Nadara, in order to succeed in this business, you do need to learn how to sell and market. And so I started training a lot in that field and I ended up um, helping, yeah, others in terms of how to sell. But then about maybe two or three years ago, I was, I was pregnant with my, my youngest son, who is now like two and a half. I was starting to feel like, you know, inside something had shifted. I had done this, you know, the sales coaching and business coaching for about seven years. And I felt like, you know, I had plateaued in that career. Like I had reached the heights that I needed to reach. I was very successful at it. I was good at it. Um, but something, it's something was missing. It was like my soul had this itch, like, okay, Nadara, you're done with this. But I was fighting it. My identity was still fighting it going, come on. Like I invested all of this effort and money and energy into building this particular part of my identity. Um, so it was kind of, yeah. So then I found myself in transition. And when I, um, when I was in that, I, I remember it was really hard to kind of put a finger on it myself. I just knew that things were breaking, like the ease that I had to get clients that was starting, it was becoming more difficult. It was like people couldn't hear me anymore. I would go to a networking event and instead of actually talking about maybe the sales and the business side of things, I would want to talk about breastfeeding because I was like right in the middle of that motherhood journey as well. So I needed an intuitive and a coach to actually help me at the time, just figure out um, what was changing and one of them actually said, hey, Nadra, honey, you're in transition. I know it's, it's really sticky and it's really messy, but I ended up hiring this intuitive um, business coach to help me tune into my mission as it is today. So that was kind of how the story developed. I was like, I started as a life coach, then had this transition into sales and business coaching. And it's like now I'm going full circle choosing life coaching again, but coming at it from having all the business experience, but also choosing a new market. Like before uh, my audience wasn't Muslim women. It was mainly healers and coaches in the wellness industry who weren't necessarily Muslim. Um, they just happened to do what they do really successfully. And they needed my help in creating premium programs in their businesses. So yeah, does that sort of give you a, a little synopsis of what the journey has been like so far you know yeah, and it's very interesting when we're met with those feelings within our gut um throughout the course of our own lives um like you said before you just kind of had that feeling um sometimes there's not a particular what, what i'm trying to get at um was there a distinct point in your life or an event that occurred that kind of um, stood out to you and kind of started that whole process um, and recognizing that you were in that process of transition. Um, how was that like? For you? Yes. Um, so especially in this career pivot, um, I remember I was teaching a class. I think it was like a, a webinar format and I had all, you know, I'd invested in a Facebook ad strategist. So I invested with this lady. She was helping me do the ads and I had all these people come from Canada and all over the world to listen to my webinar and in the webinar, it was like, I couldn't even control it, but I was looking through these slides and there was this yawn <laughs> that came out like this, oh my gosh, here we go again. Like, I'm so done with this topic, that kind of a feeling in my body. And I remember the, the night of that webinar when we were about to sleep and I think it must've been like three o'clock in the morning, I turned to my husband in bed and I was like, Bobby, I think I'm done with this business. Like it was a very clear cut like this has to be complete and you know at the time because I was charging premium prices and I had you know certain revenue goals and all of those things I also was spending in line with my revenue so I had a nanny to look after the kids and you know she would then sometimes do some of the cleaning in the house and all of that and I really had to make some tough decisions because I knew that when I decided right I'm at a point of transition I need to let this thing go you need to start letting go of things. And that can be very scary for your ego and your identity because you're like, well, who am I without these things, you know? Yeah. So that was a distinct point I remember, Ina. So that, that was a great question actually to, to take me back to a, a specific instance. Um, to take and, you a picture. Yeah, and it's really interesting you mentioned um, during that phase how you said um, you recognized and um, the need for letting certain things go. Um, and yesterday when we were talking about um, 
what we're going to discuss today for this podcast. You mentioned something that really caught my attention. It was actually the first time that I heard about this concept, um, something called the law of sacrifice. Um, so I did a bit of research um, and it's actually mentioned in a book called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell, um, which is number 18. Um, and from what I understand, um, the law of sacrifice is that when you start to rise and assume your position as a leader, um, and I guess for us in Islam, we first need to start taking ownership of our own lives. Um, we Our responsibilities increase and your rights decrease. So that is my understanding of it. Um, what is your understanding of the law of sacrifice? Yeah, so my um, introduction to the law of sacrifice was actually through a different book. I wish I could remember the name, but it was by an author called Raymond Hollywell. It was a very, very old book. Um, so here in the law of sacrifice, he actually, um, the example that he gives is of actually of a man who had a really happy, you know, successful marriage, um, but he decides to do something that's um, like of a lower nature and he started to have you know a relationship outside the marriage and he wasn't willing to sacrifice that to save the marriage in the end so it was kind of talking about it as though you know if we are not willing to sacrifice things of a lower nature uh, we can't have that thing of a higher nature and what i see it in terms of the clients i work with we're usually talking about like giving up habits that are destructive or habits that you know um are just less than our ideal version of who we actually want to be uh, like ourselves in our most self-actualized form i know we're we're all on a journey and we keep improving in sort of spirals and sometimes we go backwards before we go forwards and sometimes we have the same sort of addictions coming up or same behaviors that stall us um, but that's kind of my understanding of it. And that's how I use it. And also I use it, um, the more I sort of thought about the topic in relation to my clients and the work, um, it also came up in this conversation, like, you know, how we hear in our society, like it's, it's either on with memes on Facebook or social media that, you know, like you can have it all and these women's empowerment <laughs> movements. But I say, sometimes it's like, people don't also talk about the fact that if you are going for certain things when you're in a particular season of your life, if you say yes to something, there's also like certain no's that inherently come up as part of that conversation that people might not be talking about on social media. So for example, if um, you're saying yes to like really putting everything into your business and you haven't got help at home and you've got young children, uh, some people don't talk about the fact that your house might be upside down or, you know, in periods when the business is launching certain things that you cannot get to every single thing uh, on a, this beautiful routine, if the business is taking up all of those hours that used to be evenly spread out when you weren't as invested in it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And um, I yeah. think that kind of comes into conflict with this common belief. Uh, and maybe perhaps it is perpetuated by social media that every single aspect of our lives must be going perfectly or <laughs> As, as smoothly as we planned out and if for example one aspect of our life is not going as well as we hoped to we feel like we're a failure um and um I, I feel like maybe this is common amongst women especially perhaps mothers um they feel like they need to get everything going they need to have it all um they need to be a successful mother they need to have a successful career their social life is on point <laughs> their social career is on point um, so yeah, I do feel like we kind of put that pressure on ourselves. You're so right. And that's, and that's part of like one thing I want to be more vocal about is that at a macro level and at a micro level. So for example, as well, like say before COVID, I know, for example, in our family, sometimes we would get invited to dinners and it would be across town and, I know that I'm I'm an early to rise type of person. And when I don't have that time with myself in the morning before the kids wake up, 
I, I know I just don't feel as fulfilled that day because I haven't had that quiet with myself where my intuition can really come up and speak to me because I haven't got a lot of distraction at that time. But when I say yes to those late night dinners and then, you know, conversation just keeps going and we haven't come home at a, you know, decent hour, I just know that like, I'm just going to be really groggy the next morning and I, or I'd, I'd sleep in a bit more than I would want to. And so it's like, yeah, you suck. Like when you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And I think my question that I'd pose to anyone listening is like, are you okay with that? Are you okay with that trade-off? And I think we're, we're not so good at talking about the trade-offs, like I think as a, as a society. And I feel like we just need to be very clear about that. And I think COVID that way has, um, I mean, I've been thinking about this for like the last three years, as soon as, you know, this, my, my last baby came into the scene, but I think right now, like more and more people are discovering it for themselves anyway, just with this situation yeah. that's happened to us all, you know? It's kind of like the world has forced, I mean, COVID has kind yes. of forced the world to take a pause. Um, and we're given, we've basically been given this whole year to, I guess, reflect on everything that's been going on and everything that our status quo has been questioned um so when you talk about the law of sacrifice how does that um tie into your work um, particularly when you're working with your clients yeah so see clients usually come to me when they're they're kind of in a sticky situation and they might not even know it sometimes it's just that uh, you know, a friend might be over coffee telling another friend, yeah, like I'm at the end of this, you know, I'm, I'm in this teaching career, but it's really not giving me that juice anymore. And I just feel like it's done, but like, she doesn't know what's next, right? This is a classic example of um, Mariam, one of my past clients who had this situation. It's like a, she felt like the career was done. Um, and say, if we looked at how did the the law of sacrifice apply to her, it was actually um, like just looking at where she was just giving her energy away. Like she actually needed to have firmer boundaries with asking for help in the home and being supported by her spouse and all of that. When I think like sometimes <laughs> we don't speak up about those things. And then when we don't ask for what we need sometimes we're sacrificing a piece of ourselves that needs the expression it's like our soul is seeking expression in another form and if it doesn't get the support it needs in the right environment then that part of you can't be expressed so in this sense she had to just say no to that part of herself that used to just accept things as like, you know, accepting the status quo that this is how our home runs. And, you know, this is how much help I had. Like she actually pushed that boundary a bit and said, you know what guys, like I really want to work on Cause for her, what happened when she started to ask for what she needed and sacrifice that old identity, um, she became someone who accepted the help, you know, around the house and all of that. And also to explain her why, and that she wanted this new, um, idea to come to fruition of which for her actually, when in our coaching, when we figured out her passions were actually in food and nutrition, um, and she had just parked that part of her life and her self away because when you know when kids come sometimes it's like your identity changes and it can be really hard to pin it down as to what you used to love <laughs> before the kids arrived or what you used to love when you were in uni you know because it seems so far away but in this situation um, like her passions came forth because actually her husband had a food intolerance and she started cooking for him in a particular way, um, all these Lebanese meals, but minus the garlic and the onion. And you know how hard that is. <laughs> so she re recognized that she had all this expertise that she was sitting on because she'd do all the research to help his um, sort of problem and to ease. And she recognized that, hey, maybe there are other people, other families who are going through this and I could be a source of inspiration to them in terms of recipe development and maybe putting up a little blog. But then eventually she actually ventured out even more to saying, you know what, I could put up a, a, an online store and sell pantry staples yeah. um, with these specific um, low FODMAP products. So she's on Instagram. Oh. at low organics <laughs> but um that that's just one part of like mariam's story where the law of sacrifice came in in saying i'm saying no to this older part of my identity and the shy <laughs> like more of like a wallflower and i'm taking my my leadership as someone who actually can 
start a movement and start a business with this particular passion of mine. Yeah. So just for our listeners, um, what are, what are some uh, what is some advice that you can give to them um, if they find themselves in a similar situation um, as Miriam, for example? So similar situation where, say, um, something that they used to love or a career they had or whatever part of their life was working and then suddenly starts to feel sticky. And they just don't feel right, like you said before, like their gut is telling them they need to change something. Yeah. So I would say the first part is to acknowledge it, to actually not shove it under the carpet and say to yourself, oh, I wish I, I, you know, I could just feel happy like everybody else on Instagram or it shouldn't be this way and to start to argue with that voice. First, acknowledge that your intuition, acknowledge that your gut is giving you this little whisper and saying, hey, like pay attention. Something's not right here. That is step one because without that acknowledgement and validation of that part of you that's trying to speak to you, you can't develop a relationship with that part of yourself. Like I always... Um, like to tell the story of um, like our souls, like where our souls came from, you know, they were, they were not in your body. They were all baking in light and we were all created at once. If you believe in the Islamic tradition of, yeah, how all the souls were created and they're just baking in that consciousness and that nor and that light. Um, And over there, like you just knew things, you knew what your vision was, you knew what your mission was. And then when we're sent here as humans, it's like, it's so dense, here we forget and you know and Allah says in the Quran that yeah you're forgetful creatures <laughs> we made you forgetful mm-hmm. and so in these moments when you have these moments of truth coming up from your gut or your soul on earth it's really important to just slow down and pay attention because it's trying to have a new way be shown to you but if you don't stop and acknowledge it that voice like it goes oh well she's not listening I'll be quiet for another couple of months and then I'll have to bring it up again maybe this time she'll have to get a um, a bit sick or an illness or something has to happen so we pause and stop all the distractions because now she can't hear me so I have to speak louder so something will start to break down to just get your attention again so does that make sense like it's it's a bit um, bit of a, a tricky, a tricky space to be, but I always feel like prevention is better than cure. So listen when you have been given that little nudge that something's not right. Um, and I, I think we also touched upon this yesterday um, in our brief conversation. How we have that inner voice, um, and sometimes it's kind of quiet, um, kind of dampened down, whether it be due to environmental factors or societal pressures or our family telling us this. Um, so how do you help navigate your clients to um, kind of reconnect with themselves or their souls or their inner voice? Um, and how do you use that to kind of guide them um, along their life, maybe to reimagine um, or to rediscover what their mission is within um yeah oh I love that question um so the first part in connecting with that part of you that inner that inner voice that all already kind of knows what trajectory you need to go on um is you can do it with your breath and your breathing like we sometimes I I find that we go about our lives and we we can forget to breathe and the breath just brings us back so I always encourage them and you can even do this with me Ines like even if you take two fingers and put it right below your belly button that's like where your truth lies especially in women like what makes us different is that we have a womb and men do not, right? So that's like your womb space. That's where you're like, we're very connected to the earth and all its wisdoms. And then you're also connected to the cosmos and all that light that comes through like electricity kind of, you know? So we have to have this connection working really well. Um, that sort of um, the the light and then this earth energy, right? That that we're made of clay. So it's it's those two kind of energies mixing. So the breath just kind of, it just allows you to slow down, to pause. And it's like when you breathe in, um, if you have your fingers on your belly button, always just imagine like someone's, you know, blowing into a balloon and the balloon's kind of going outward. So you, it's like when you watch a baby breathe, they breathe like this naturally. They're very connected to themselves. So it's like a breathe in 
and then out. And then I always also allow my clients to let out a sigh. Like, you know, like sometimes we don't make sounds or uh, women, especially like, it's like we're almost trained to be quiet, you know, just be seen and not heard. And when we have that exhale and we allow ourselves to go, ah, like let that out, it's also just relief. It's like all these things, it's like the breath goes into all the cells in our body. And then when you let it out, it's like a healing breath, right? And once they do, I might get them to do that about three to five times. And I'm listening for whether they're, they're like actually feeling a bit more connected and still because they would have been doing whatever they were doing before they got into the session. And then from there, I just start to ask them questions that are very open-ended questions that they cannot answer with their mind and the busy part of their minds. It's only their intuition that can answer that. And so usually coaches are trained, um, you know, to ask those open-ended questions that like, they don't just end with a yes or a no. Um, it's just, you ask those questions to your gut. You ask those questions of your intuitive self. And usually they're Questions that build energy as opposed to deplete your energy. So if we're always thinking about what went wrong in our lives and what didn't work, I'm automatically taking my client to a place where they don't like themselves or thinking of all their failures. But I ask them questions that actually get them to think about the areas of their life that where there was a spark of joy, um, where they were doing really well and they enjoyed their life at that point. And they, then when they start to remember, when the memories start to come back, they're already connecting with that part of themselves that's vibrating at like a higher frequency than when they're in this sort of stuck I'm in a rut kind of place because like I don't know where to go from here so does that make sense just to give you like a an opening as to where where, where we're starting in a session like that yeah. or there's more to that question I know so to ask me a follow-up <laughs> um so you know, when you're meeting up with clients and they're within that very sticky um part of their lives where they're transitioning um I think I know for me it's when I'm met with those situations it's really really scary especially when you're trying to tap into your inner voice or you're trying to listen to mm. perhaps your heart for example and it can maybe it goes against what you're what you've been told throughout your whole life um yes that's a big one yeah, it's very very scary um and I know that requires a lot of courage um, so how can you, if you, if a client came to you with that similar problem, what would you tell them um, and how would you help navigate um, themselves throughout that um, transition within their lives? Yeah, I always like to remember, um, so if we're talking to a client who's Muslim and they, you know, they know our tradition well about um, that last day when you're meeting your creator and you're standing in front of Allah, um, I just get them to kind of imagine that end of like, you do not have anybody around you to answer to. You only have your creator to answer to, who's going to ask you about how you lived your life on earth. You know, like, how did you earn your money? How did you spend it? It's like, what did you do in your youth? You know? And so can you put your hand on your heart and say that you took all of the gifts that you were given and that you utilize them while you were here, whether you were a mom, whether you were single, whether you were a single parent, whatever, the circumstance doesn't actually matter. But it's like, can you, yeah, be good with that meeting, like where you can answer those questions out of integrity. And that usually starts to get the courage muscle going because it's like, you're not answering to how your parents view you or a well-meaning relative who says, oh, you know, that career that you're trying to get into, like, I don't know about that. It's not a good time to start a business in that or, you know, everybody else's because I feel like that's what happens. It's like courage starts to, go, it has this inverse relationship. If we put so much of our emphasis on those other voices and we then kind of diminish that voice of truth and we then we start to believe all those other voices as opposed to the voice within that's kind of already giving us these nudges about a particular direction. Um, and also I feel like courage, it's something that has to be practiced. So in any sort of area of leadership in your life, if you're trying to make a change in something, you can't expect yourself to go from like a zero to a hundred all at once. Like, you know, we were talking about uh, Mariam earlier as well. Like 
um, at first when we were having this session, I said, oh, like if you like this, you know, this food journey, how, like I had this idea that came to me in the session. I said, what about, uh, you know, you cook certain uh, like recipes that you're, you really love and then you invited your family and friends over. This was before COVID and you had a taster, you know, like a tasting session and you just kind of launched this very beautifully, very simply behind the scenes. And even like that scared her, right? So that was too much of a stretch. And so when she kind of sat with it for about a week, she went, you know what, what I actually can do is just start a blog or just start an Instagram page. Like that didn't seem like too much of a stretch. But then in between what happened was somebody um, in the health and wellness field actually was looking for somebody to cook meals for her family because she had ran a successful um, health uh, and coaching business and she just needed you know some help around the home and so Mariam actually put her hand up to cook for that family so even though like we had this food vision like it was like life was giving her opportunities to just test and like get herself out there and that like I thought that was incredibly courageous I thought that was more courageous saying yes and you know you know responding to that lady on like a Facebook story or something and saying hey I can cook for you I thought that was more courageous than having your family and friends over so it's very intrinsic you know and it's like you will know what to stretch for you um, so that's just something to think about. Like it's a practice and that it's spectrum. Like I think, I feel like courage is a spectrum. So you don't have to go from zero to a hundred, but find a place where you're a little bit on the edge. <laughs> you have butterflies in your stomach, but the, the, the butterflies don't stop you from taking that. It's just the first step. It's not all the way. It's like her idea of courage in that situation where she responded to the Facebook story was just to respond, not to think about the job and how she's going to cook and what's going to happen with the meals. All she had to do was take the first step. Like, let me just send this lady a message. Like that was it and stop. And then you'll see another response coming back because it's this law of cause and effect, like the law of sacrifice, right? You put a bit in and then something happens, <laughs> a ripple effect. So does that make sense in us? Like in terms of the courage piece? Definitely. Um, and I think this aligns very well with um, but what you're talking about before where um, we're essentially put here on earth um, or our life's journey is to kind of seek out our own truth. And um, that can look very different um, from one person to another. Um, so how does that feeling of truth, um, how, can that, how, how can we identify that within our own bodies? Mm, oh, I love that question. Because actually, it's a very unique experience. So for example, um, I would actually encourage each woman listening to this um, to start a journal of some sort of just paying attention to when something was really speaking to them, and they followed the advice of their that inner self, like nudging them to do something and like what happened as a result of actually following the guidance, right, as opposed to saying, no, 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 I don't believe that. And I'm going to do something else. So for myself, um, I feel it like it's, it's a knowing it, it's just I can't explain to somebody how I know, I just know. So that's like a knowing kind of uh, type. That's one. For some people, they might just get a little vision. So they, they'll be shown like, like a flash of inspiration, like just a flash of a vision that just, they just know it's really uncanny. Like, I feel like, yeah, that's the thing. And for some, it might be a voice in like their inner ear, like um, just a voice saying, go this way, go in this direction. So for all of us, like if it, it comes across all of the five senses. So it's like, um, mainly either through touch, through like a knowing. I think some some of it's called like claircognizance, clair, clairvoyance, clairaudience. So it's all of those um, kind of modalities of knowing. Does that, yeah. is that enough kind of <laughs> to, for people to grasp, do you think? No, I think so. Um, what, would, what would yours be, Ines? Like, have you got a special like spidey sense of like what it could be for you based on your experience? Yes. Um, so for me, I just have this feeling within my gut. Right. Yeah. So a gut person. Yeah. I don't know if um, you're like this, but um, I just kind of have this feeling. It doesn't usually come as a vision or as a voice. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I kind of can kind of tell within my inner body if something doesn't feel resonate. Right. 
Yeah. Yes. If, if I ignore it, it manifests itself physically. So I would get really sick, for example, or I'd feel very tired or I'd have mm. some sort of, yeah, I could feel it within Like a body, body, like a visceral reaction to not following it, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I, uh, I love that you're, you're so sensitive to that and like you've actually acknowledge how it works because I feel like you and I probably have a similar way of knowing like for me I need to test things so some you know if it might be even like a business idea or something I'm really mulling around with and I go yeah I need to test it to see if this is the direction and then I'll take a small step towards it and if it's still feeling good yep I can continue but then I get uh uh-uh like an uh uh-uh feeling in my gut I have to stop And that means I have to rework the issue and go something in this offer or something in this direction is something's off. I really need to sit with that and tweak some things before I go out again. So it's very much like this feedback loop. And I love that you said like, yeah, if you don't listen to it, you either get sick or you, you'll feel it inside. I think for me, like, yeah, I, I, I get this like a nervous reaction. Like I'm, it's like this, very um it's like getting the shakes like oh this is really not feeling right and it's like a, a siren in the body trying to say uh uh-uh, uh uh-uh, not that way not that way please <laughs> so it's yeah it is i i love talking about this stuff because i think the more we recognize it and the more people can kind of tune into that like the more we'll just be guided as because because i yeah it feels like our life has a direction and there's a life force uh guiding you in a particular direction and you just have to get with the program you know, when it, when you're going off course, the siren has to bring you back to go, no, 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 <laughs> not that way. Please get back, get back on track. And we do go off track sometimes when we don't listen, but you can always do a U-turn, you know? Definitely. And it's kind of like someone once told me um, that the heart is always king. Um, so we always know what's best for us and we always know what will work best for us, but we just kind of have to, um, dampen down all of that excess noise and perhaps like put put our lives on hold to ensure that we can listen to ourselves and like you said before it's something that comes with practice um so I remember for me because when I was growing up I was always someone who would people please and that I think (laughs) yeah maybe this would um tie in with the law of sacrifice I was saying yes to the people outside um and (laughs) myself and that really did manifest itself physically so I was always very anxious always very nervous and very unhappy with my life and just always felt very uneasy inside of me but um there was this very interesting time in my life a couple of years ago where my cousin introduced me to some sheikh I don't know we're having like a very deep conversation and he seemed very intuitive um looked dead straight into my eyes and just (laughs) I worry for you, Ines, but if you follow your heart, you will be okay. And it was a very mm-hmm. like tumultuous and very messy and painful period of my life. But for some reason, that just always stuck with me. So I've always yeah. tried to keep it within my consciousness. And subhanAllah, it was very, very weird. But every, like people would just come into my life and um, they would kind of bring in that message. So um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so someone else came into my life and they would advise me like your heart is king listen to your heart and there were certain events in my life where I just kind of followed my gut even though it was crazy but alhamdulillah like it turned out to be very very positive experience or some of the best decisions that I've taken um within my own life um it's very interesting yeah yeah so for sure like and yeah you said it so perfectly because I feel like yeah like our, our soul lives in the heart and and you know we I think when we were we were created as souls like we got to experience all that magnificence all that perfection um and we kind of reflected you know the those divine qualities and so I feel like when we're we come down to earth and we get busy or that our, the state of our heart has been kind of neglected as well. And we've, you know, because of saying yes to everybody else, not listening and all of that, like it, it becomes, it's like, yeah, it's like that beautiful shiny mirror just gets a bit like murky mm-hmm. and we need to clean it <laughs> before it can reflect this light again, you know? And then that's why like, you know, you can have so many coaches these days or so many businesses maybe selling, you know, similar things, but because of the heart of the business owner having a particular quality that their customer needs 
you get served by different people in different ways. So it's that jewel that's in your heart is very unique to you. Yeah. Uh, so maybe someone's heart needs courage and then they come to a particular person whose heart like really has that in, in droves. And then for another person, their heart just, just has this peacefulness about it. And that person needs peace. <laughs> so they go to that person and they get it. And it happens like, yeah, with relationships, with friendships, because yeah, we reflect these qualities in very unique ways. So I love that. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting to see how sometimes when you're seeking something out within your life, and you're kind of tapping into that inner voice or inner feeling or inner truth, um, that life kind of presents those opportunities for you. And it's kind of like what you said before, life is kind of testing you to see whether or not you really, <laughs> whether or not you're going to really go after it. Um, yes. And I think that also highlights the importance of perhaps creating our environment in a way that would benefit us or surrounding yourself with people that um, are aligned with um, your life visions or your life goals. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like for me, I find that like the reason I even started prioritized to pivot was because the problem that I was seeing with the marketplace was, okay, so there's all these people, sometimes coaches like telling people what to do. Um, but there's nobody holding space so that the person themselves can get an understanding and tune in to what they needed to do next. Cause it's like, it's really, because it's really uncomfortable to just sit there with yourself. Like how easy is it to just grab your phone and then get Instagram open and then start watching other people's lives. And then you start living their lives, like instead of reflecting on your own life. And then you don't even know what questions to ask yourself. You're like, okay, okay. So I'm by myself. I'm with my journal, but now what? You know, so that's where I felt like the gap was, okay, there's nobody like allowing people to come into an intentional space that's set up for that deep listening and that they're guided in it. Like they're not just left to their own devices where they don't know what to do. It's like every step is guided and they know that if they know they need it, they have, they can intentionally set time aside to do that, you know, and whether they do it once a season, every three months or whether they just do it once a year, it's like, we all need tune ups. <laughs> it's like getting your car serviced. So it runs smoothly, you know, it's like doing the listening intentionally because I read somewhere in a book, I can't remember what book it was, but I really loved it. And it said the more, um, in, like if we don't intentionally set aside time to do this sort of work, the deep inner listening, the more unintentional escapes we will make. And that's probably what I'm seeing happening, right? These days, like, especially with, um, you know, social media being such an easy thing to just fall into, or there's Netflix or whatever the vice might be. Uh, it's just like, it's because it's uncomfortable to do this work sometimes by yourself, or you don't know where to start. We, we go for the easy thing. And the easy thing would be just put on the TV and just watch show after show or uh, just, yeah, you just, maybe just go just to look at what one friend is doing on Instagram, but then you get caught up looking at a whole bunch of things. and like, wait, how did I end up here? You know? So I think that it's, it's, yeah, it's just a delicate <laughs> balance and it's catching yourself and going, you know what? There are spaces that you can go and like to tune in. So how can one um, kind of create an environment that they can access this part of themselves where they can tune in um, and listen to that inner voice or inner truth? Um, well, one is I'm going to put my hand up for what I actually do. Like people can actually, you know, follow me and connect with me and be in environments where people are actually talking about this. So it's actually in your awareness, it's in your consciousness. Um, so whether you go to prepare for the hour.com or I also help um, individuals either one-to-one -one or in small groups do this work. And we do, it, it goes over a three-week window so that the environment is set up intentionally to have all of, like to go through this whole process of doing the deep inner work, really listening for your vision so that we conceptualize the vision in those three weeks. 
And then I notice what happens after is it's like, because you're clear about your vision, opportunities find you, you become a magnet to it because before it was like, we're trying to build a house without knowing what on earth your house was going to look like and not spending the time really envisioning what the end, you know, like the picture would be. And so in the three weeks, part of the session is actually just really lighting up that vision. And so once you've got a clear vision, it's like when you go out into the world outside of the sessions or outside of that environment, it's like you're sending these little bat signals <laughs> about who you are and what it is you're here to create. And then people start to connect with you or like Mariam seeing that opportunity to cook uh, for that particular family. Like I'm sure it would have just gone straight past her had she not known that she needed to make a pivot into the food industry, right? It would have gone like, oh, okay, that's a nice Facebook story. <laughs> but in that moment, her gut was like, hello like here you go this is a window to your food journey and your path down this you know uh, particular trajectory so I feel like yeah the clarity that you get in these environments then help you become uh, yeah just a magnet for things and also you're more easily able to spot opportunity and then opportunity actually requires courage because it never meets you at the level of your comfort zone. Opportunity always meets you at a level that's a little bit higher than you're currently comfortable with. So you'll have to take a step. It's like if you imagine a staircase, the opportunity won't come like at a flat level where your foot is. Like you'll have to reach for it and put a foot up. And so that's again where that law of sacrifice comes in. Like you're going to have to give up some ideas about yourself or beliefs about yourself that, oh, no, 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 I, I can't do that. You have to just go, no, okay, what if I can? What if it, I am meant to do this? And then take that little first step that's a little outside your comfort zone. So you're kind of, working with your edge a little bit of the unknown there <laughs> always kind of you're on the cusp of discomfort yes. yeah yes that's where the fun is i think that's where the adventure is that's where we feel most alive and i feel like most of us i think when we get into that uh, state in our lives where things are sticky or things are breaking down is because life is inviting us to kind of shed those old layers and they're like calling you and go like, oh, yes, like yeah. here, <laughs> this is what's available to you. And so it needs to find you in that little bit of muck so that you go, gosh, is this all like, is this it? Like, is this what life's meant to be? Or is there something there for me that has my name written on it? It's got my fingerprint through it. And I just need to, yeah. Like even when you think about branding or anything, it's like people are just trying to put their fingerprint on it, you know, that their little jewel that's in their heart to be expressed in the outside world. And I love, I just love that whole creative process that enables somebody to do that, which is why like, I love business. I love anybody doing something that just hasn't been created before. Because I feel like, I think these days, especially after COVID as well, I feel like the earth, like the planet, like it's asking for us to be more creative. It's asking us to be pioneers. Mm -hmm. And when the road for pioneering people and for innovative people with a vision, like the road hasn't been built, you know? So that's why you can't just swipe a template off Facebook and expect to know how to do your vision because otherwise like you would see it out there already, but it hasn't been created yet. Like you're being asked and invited to create it in your way. And that takes time. It's like a craft because it's not cookie cutter. It's not something like a drive through or like Mac is where you can just grab and go. It, it, it requires patience. It requires time. It requires sustained effort. And I feel like, again, we've been fed that lie. Like, you know, you can just, um, it's like you can get something for nothing. No way can you get something for nothing. There is sacrifice involved, like time, effort, energy, money sometimes. But there is that um, it's coming full circle back into like, what are you willing to give up or give um, in order to receive this vision? So maybe, you know, in your lifetime, you may not get to see all the fruits of your labor, but whether it's a generation that comes after you, you're building something, you know? And I feel like all these gut people as well, we're builders. Like we create things so that the people coming after us can have an easier time. <laughs> in life and you know we pay respects to all the people who came before us who made life easier for us definitely it's kind of like that poem that comes to my mind by robert frost um where he says and i quote um the two roads diverged in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference yes oh i love that <laughs> did you have that in your head already Ines, um, or like someone your yeah, your favorite 
Yeah, so that actually, um, that stuck in my mind from a movie. I think it's called The Dead Poet Society. Um, right. Yeah, and I kind of quickly Googled it. <laughs> to be quite but that is, because um, he basically, he's a teacher, um, and he uses poetry to kind of um, provide that space and give that space to students to explore their own paths and explore um, who they are. So that just kind of popped up in my head. Um, Gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit That's beautiful. Um, well, I'm a bit conscious of time, and I'm aware yes. of our hour. Um, yes. Is, uh, even though it has not felt like an hour at all, it went so quickly, didn't it? <laughs> I felt like we were talking for five minutes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so, if someone after listening to this conversation, if they want to reach out, where can they find you? Um, I would go to, if I were you, preparefortheour.com. Uh, that's where I'm currently rebranding and building this movement. And that's when, you know how we talked about, um, imagine standing in front of your creator and being asked, like, what did you do with your life? I feel like if everybody asked themselves, what am I doing to prepare for that meeting? Yeah. Preparefortheour.com. Like you, it instantly <laughs> shifts your state into what am I doing to prepare for it? So, uh, so you can go there because that way when I have um, programs open and available to join, that way I can keep in touch with you. But otherwise, if you know you have a cool story to share about your own experience, you can catch me in a DM on Instagram. So just Instagram, um, it's Nadara Razak. Um, just my name, my full name. You yeah. can find me there and send me a DM. So that's <laughs> N-A-D-H-I-R-A. R A Z A C K, and we will be putting your um, social media handles um, within our uh, Instagram page as well. Beautiful. Thank you for having me today, Ines. And Thank you so much for having me. the time. It was so enjoyable. Thank you.